What was the biggest challenge in adapting uh, Reversal of Fortune? Well, the biggest challenge is it was about a, um, it's about an appeal. If you do something that's about a trial, a trials are inherently dramatic, right or wrong, it's over. An appeal is, you know, it's 120 pieces of paper and submit it to a bunch of judges. You have a brief hearing. They ask you some questions, some of which are irrelevant, and then you find out the result. It was completely anti-dramatic. Plus, you have to recap, in order to, to tell a story about an appeal, you have to recap the entire case. So the problem was, how do, you, how, do you, how do you tell the story? Well, you can have the lawyer summarizing it. So, you know, God bless Ed Pressman, because he, who was the producer, because he mentioned, you know, you know Ed has this little la macabre laugh. Um, yeah, they use it to great effect in Crime Wave, that Sam, <laughs> yes, exactly. Sam Raimi film he appears in. And I know, it. exactly. And, um, and he said, you know, what if you told it from Sonny's point of view? And then he giggled. And, you know, I went home and I just started to write Sonny's dialogue. And I said, okay, this is the way to tell the movie. And that's how you resolve kind of the that's challenge. That's how I resolved that. The, that challenge, yes. So that was the biggest challenge, although, you know, there were times when I thought, oh my God, he's guilty. I, I'm writing a movie, of, you know, ex essentially a, a playful and fun, at times funny movie about a guy who's a murderer. I can't do that. But then the next day, I would say, no, I don't think he is guilty. And I ended up feeling that he was not guilty of trying to murder his wife, which allowed me to do it. Although I mentioned it's a comedy. It, we had kind of a funny story in that regard. And the, the film was financed partially by... Um, Warner Brothers, partially by a foreign company called Sovereign and partially by a Japanese co company. So as a result, no one could tell us what to do. Um, you know, Warner Brothers could always say, well, we don't like the film, we're going to bury it. They could give it a bad release, but no one could force us to do anything. Had they been able to force us, they would have, after the first preview, they would have told us to take out the voiceover because, you know, in terms of the biggest negative, that was the biggest negative. And for anyone who likes the film, it, it's essential. You can't have this movie without the voiceover. But you know, if people were trying to raise the numbers, that's what they would have done. So that was a case where too many cooks in the kitchen was a good thing. Too many cooks definitely was a good thing. Yes. Well, in terms of it being about appeal, it's very that was very apropos because how do you? I mean, it, it, we we're all accustomed to the courtroom drama as a genre, and there's no appeal genre. So there's no. You had to find many ways into that story that made it exciting for two and a half hours. That's right. When the movie was, the movie was sent to Telluride and Tom Luddy saw the film and put it in the program notes that it was a comedy. And Warner Brothers was outraged because they said, this is a serious film. You're describing our film as a comedy and you can't do that. And, and you know, the program had already been printed and so there was nothing they could do about it. And then the film played and people laughed all the way through it. Now, there are no jokes in the movie, but they're things that are funny because they're odd. And, um, I mean, there, I guess Klaus does tell a few jokes, but they're, you know, in the conventional sense. So then they said, oh my goodness, it's a comedy. They didn't realize what the film was and how it worked until they saw it in front of an audience. Well, Klaus and Dershowitz are almost a comedy team. They're, they're scenes together. I mean, they're the classic, you know, opposites attract kind of comedy team. And that I know. It's a wonderful um, thing to have in the screenplay. It, well, you know, and also it was, it was um, I was so fortunate that Barbet directed it because Barbet is, no one is, and I say this, with the most affection and respect. No one is more perverse than Barbet. Uh, and he has such an appreciation for Klaus and for that kind of ambivalence, and he's able to do it without judging. Mm -hmm. Somebody else would have been judging him along the way or judging Dershowitz, and you know, then the comedy wouldn't have worked, wouldn't have been felt, wouldn't have been there. Do you think uh, European directors have that over American directors for the most part? Well, yes. You know, for someone to become a director in America, they, I mean, I don't know, generalizations are absurd, but... But fun. But, but, but fun, <laughs> yes. You, you know, it's almost like a certain degree of sincerity is required. 
And it, it, Europeans have a much more forgiving view of human behavior. Americans are, are, we are a deeply moral people, but morality can also be a kind of a vice. It can, be, it can constrict you, and it can, can cut you off from a larger kind of morality which accepts the humanity in everyone, which allows us to make mistakes, to be, make fools of ourselves, to do occasionally things that are very wrong and still be good people. So a, a less pro provincial morality. Exactly. Did your career change at all after the Oscar nomination? I guess it did, yeah. I mean, uh, I got paid more money, which is always good. They say, you know, uh, in Hollywood, it, if they ask you to do something free, it means that's what they, that's, they have no respect for you at that's all. That's what they think it's worth. <laughs> that's what they think it's worth, yes, exactly. Um, and were you able to like, kind of pick your own assignments, or did you get more things thrown at you after that? I, I, I really did, but the odd thing is that now, I write almost exclusively on spec because I, I just, I mean, for instance, uh, uh, reversal of fortune is not a job I would take now because I wasn't that fascinated with the case. Uh, you know, what happened was Patty Hearst had just come out. The film didn't do very well. I was very depressed that it didn't do well. I wanted to throw myself into something. They came to me. They proposed this. Uh, I had a, you know, a conversation with Ed all of a sudden, they started write, writing Sonny's dialogue. And when I start writing something off the bat, when I start hearing voices, then I know that I have to do it. So I, I, I accept it. But now I'm just looking to do you know, certain things. You know, I have certain ideas that feel to me so good, so elegant. You know, I'm really attracted to conceptual ideas. I wrote a a script about the conquest of Mexico, which also seems like maybe it's getting made now, finally, after 17 years. Um, and in researching that, there was a footnote in a book about this ritual of the Crow Indians. And I read that footnote, and I put it aside, and I said, I have to write New York, do this Crow ritual, but with a New York City cop in the present day. And, and I just put that aside, and finally I realized, you know, I don't write cop movies. I got to get somebody who does, and my friend Henry, you know, does. So I brought it to him, and we worked it out together and wrote it together. Um, but there's, you know, it's a, it's a really wild movie, and and it's something, you know, it's related to, you know, I guess Taxi Driver, and you know, but Taxi Driver is a uh, so dark, so dark, and this movie has an exuberance. To it and redemptive ultimately, and it's, yeah, yeah. And, and it's ultimately about redemption. So, you know, I, I look for things that are that are new and different, and, and so I end up writing my own scripts mostly because the the things that you get approached to write usually aren't that very aren't that interesting. And do they come at you with like after Reversal of Fortune? Did you get like ten black comedies to write, or after Fallen did you get submitted ten horror films from the studios? They tend to type you. They really do type you, and you know I resist. Type so I, I don't even know because I, I don't want to do another black comedy unless it's unless it's fantastic you know unless it's something you know, I want to do something different so you know I did Bi bicentennial man a film that uh, you know honestly I don't think turned out as well as I'd hoped it would um, but because it was a kind of a fable mm -hmm. and you know I, I again I read the novella on which it was based and I started to write dialogue and more dialogue and more dialogue. And um, so it became something that I had to do. And you mentioned this before, but um, how do you know a spec script you're writing is worth completing? You, get, you, you know by a certain point that you're going to take it all the way through it? Well, I don't start to write it unless I've really got, unless I know what the end is and I know it's going to work. For instance, Fallen, I thought about for three or four years before I wrote it. Uh, Dream Lover that you alluded to earlier, I had um, the idea for, I, I figured out one twist after thinking about it for like three years, but I didn't have the twist at the very end until, and when I got the twist at the very end, then I knew I could write it. So, you know, I really wait, in terms of authenticity that you referred to before, I really wait until 
I know that I've got a safe place to land before I start. Now, in terms of, of whether a script is worth writing, whether, it's, whether I feel it's commercial, I just feel like, would I want to go see this film? And then, you know, I mean, there are things that you know only you want to see, <laughs> you and a few other weirdos. But also you feel that if you, if you can do it properly, there are a lot more weirdos out there than you normally would, would think. So, uh, so you would go see it. And, and I'm there opening day for most weird, weirdo <laughs> right, movies. Exactly. Is it true that you can always make a screenplay better? Do you think you reach a point of diminishing returns? You know, I, I'm consoled by the fact that um, Seven, David Fincher went back to the original screenplay. I know that um, um, David Peoples, Unforgiven, Clint used the original script. Often you hear these stories about the directors reading the script, really liking it, saying, you know, I'd like to read, read the original screenplay and going back and getting the original screenplay. And that's the one that they shoot. I don't think a screenplay can always get better. I think that usually they get worse. Um, not always, you know, sometimes the person has a great idea and they haven't executed it properly. Sometimes they, they, they haven't mined everything that they, that they sometimes they're afraid. Um, sometimes they haven't thought it out properly. But I think that there's a terrible tendency to tinker and that this very idea that a screenplay can, can always get better is pernicious because as a human being, I have faults, you have faults, we all have faults. Even a great movie has faults. I remember seeing The Godfather and walking out of it with a friend of mine, and I said, what do you think? He said, well, it had problems, but you know, I mean, here's a film that's usually voted one of the top five films of all time, and my friend is, and his criticisms were not invalid. I remember walking out of Taxi Driver, which is one of my favorite films, one of my favorite scripts, and in terms of what you might learn from a script was very valuable to me. And I walked out of it with two friends when it came out, and they were critical of it. They were finding fault here and there. Well, I think a great movie should have personality. And that personality means that there are flaws. And you don't have to correct the flaws. When you correct the flaws, you're eliminating personality. The Greek word for tragic flaw actually means, in Greek, defining characteristic. So the thing which makes the character is the thing which makes the flaw. Charlie Kaufman's movies are um, highly admired. And yet, if you analyze them, they almost all, all of them have some problems in the third act and the things that don't really work. But they're part of the fabric. And if you were to clean it up entirely, maybe the whole thing wouldn't work as well. Um, I heard a story about um, my agent uh, represents Ron Shelton. And supposedly, when they were doing Bull Durham, they had the first test and went very well. They was, got like a 90. So then, but then there were audience comments, and they did some recutting, and they tested it again. It was 86. And they listened to what the audience said, and then they tested it again. It was 82. So Joe Roth said, we better stop testing this movie before we ruin it, you know? Put back with anything you want, go with what you think is the best version of it. You know, the, the, if, you, listen, if you, you try to improve things, you can change them, and change them can be fatal. You don't want to change the DNA, which is you know, something I referred to earlier. Every, every movie, every script in every movie has, has a certain DNA. And things which may seem illogical may work. I mean, an interesting example to me is history of violence. History of violence is based on a graphic novel, as you know. When you understand this based on a graphic novel, certain things make sense that kind of make sense in the theater, but otherwise you're going, for instance, you have the opening scene, which is beautiful, and you see these two killers, and they've, they've shot up this, and then and at the end of that sequence, 
the guy's going to sh is shooting a little girl. And then you cut to this little girl in the family, and she's waking up from a nightmare. Well, everybody in the family, her mother, her father, and her older brother, all come into the bedroom and try to comfort her after her nightmare. You tell me that ever happens, ever. And yet, and okay, so there's one example. You also have these, this bizarre sex scene where she's, she's, where she's acting like a cheerleader. You know, it's, it's really wild. And there are a number of things in there which feel odd or mythic or discordant. And yet, as a whole, it's, it's a, you know it's a David Cronenberg film. You know it's a David Cronenberg film. As a whole, it fits together. If you tried to smooth those things out, the movie wouldn't work as well. It might seem more real. It might make more, quote, sense in a way, but it wouldn't be as good. It's interesting that you bring up Taxi Driver and History of Violence because they both come at the same point almost in entirely different narrative ways. Yeah, about, that's right. And, and Crazy Dog does too, to an extent of what, what virtues we extol for security. That's right, yeah. What's the script that's helped you the most in the business? Well, probably Act Close Range and Reversal of Fortune helped me. You know, Act Close Range because it got me sort of over the hump and, and accepted as a serious writer in Reversal because it got nominated and, and you know, people liked it. <laughs> Have you had a consistent challenge personally as a writer throughout your career or some, you know, challenging aspect to your writing? I've written certain films with a distinct style. Animals that I referred to and Act Close Range were written in a certain way, and sometimes I write in that way, but I try, to, I try to write every script as if it's written by somebody else, a different person. So it's not like there's one thing that you felt you needed to improve on. It's well, I, the only thing, I mean, I wish I was, I wish structure were easier for me, because I really have difficulty with it. It doesn't, plot doesn't flow easily and naturally. Um, I have to feel my way. But I'm kind of consoled. I, I, I sponsored a, an event at the Writers Guild a few years ago. And we had four panels. And the first panel was on structure. And um, Steve Zalian and Scott Frank did that panel. And what they said was, and I forget which one of them said that, this, but they agreed on it. They said, you know, people say you can't reinvent the wheel. You shouldn't try to reinvent the wheel. He said, but actually, you have to reinvent the wheel. Because if you're doing something which is good, it's not that you can't use everything you've learned, but it's a particular challenge to tell this story in the best possible way. So you sort of have to go back as if you knew nothing and, and make it fresh. And I think that's true. And, and it certainly flies in the face of the strict constructionist view of screenwriting, where certain events are supposed to occur at certain places, and it breaks down neatly into acts. And you know, I mean, my wife writes this way, and she's, her, her feel for structure is really amazing. But I can't do that. I, I, I have to move from character and from one each event, I mean, I think I have an innate sense of structure, which saves me, but not always. <laughs> so that must have been a good collaboration on Matilda, because you brought different things to the table. Well, it was very interesting, because um, essentially, uh, I wrote like the first 10 or 15 pages and gave it to her. Then she did an outline. Robin's outlines she knows what's going to happen on every page. She writes down on the left-hand column of a legal 1 through 120, and she knows what's going to happen on every page. Well, for me, I, I could never write that way. That'd be like being in a straitjacket. I would never write anything good. So I then wrote the first draft trying to deviate from her outline as much as I possibly could so I wouldn't feel like I was in a straitjacket, and trying to be as wild and undisciplined, knowing that Robin's feel for discipline was so intense that she would bring it back into control, and she did. So it was fun, and it was great. What do you find your inspiration for, for writing in general? From all sources, or any, you've adapted things, you've written, you're writing specs now? Well, you know, I mean, uh, the first script that I wrote, Animals, was a spec. Fallen was a spec. I know a lot, I've been writing right. specs all along. Sometimes 
it's just an image that comes to me. I mean, the fallen, for, the, for people who haven't seen it, is about a demon that passes by touch. And I started to think about how evil is contagious. And I noticed that if um, my, if Robin got mad at me and said something unpleasant to me, I was likely to say something. I found myself saying something harsh to our older daughter. And then she would say something harsh to the younger daughter. It was as if you could just see. She's angry, so I'm angry, so you're angry, so you're angry. And I, I, I saw this growing up within the, my family of origin, too. And I realized that, you know, this... So I started thinking about that. And then I want to start thinking about, you know, I saw somebody on the street touching somebody in a way that looked just slightly ominous. And with this catastrophic imagination that I have, you know, it was, you know, and it just built from there. It's literally, I just went from this image of a hand touching to building the whole screenplay. And it took a long time to build it, to figure, that, figure out the plot and so forth. Over the course of your career, do you think the business has changed at all? Do you think the, either the craft of screenwriting or the business or both have changed? I think that it's, okay, everything's gotten harder. It's gotten hard, you know, they make fewer serious movies. They make fewer interesting movies. Uh, I think that there are more writers writing uh, based on schematic models. Um, and fewer writers writing out of character. But also, I, I just think that the, the, because movies have gotten so expensive, executives feel more fear, and that fear rules, and that fear forces executives to try to make your screenplay perfect. And as I said, said perfection is the enemy of art. It's the enemy of character. It's the enemy of anything which is dynamic and interesting. If you, if you look at Godfather 2, which is also rated one of the you know, best films of all time, sure. in a certain sense, structurally, it's kind of a, a lovely mess. And he's cutting back and forth in this wonderful way between these stories. But you know he's doing that based on feel, and you know, I'm sure he had a, an idea in the screenplay, and, and there were certain places where he would naturally cut, but there are other places where you feel him doing it and you realize, wow, you know, you couldn't get away with so many things. The, the movies that we love, the movies that got us into the business, so many of them wouldn't be made today. And it's kind of terrifying because the movies that, that people in their 20s are seeing, so many of them are not adventuresome. What advice would you offer a screenwriter starting out today? Well. You know, I've had the same agent for 25 years, and one of the reasons I've stayed with him is because of this speech that he gives. And sometimes I'll call him up and he'll say, give me the speech. And the speech goes something like this. And it's a speech which pertains particularly to rewriting, and particularly to notes. Because, you know, I said earlier, you know, so often, I reach a point on any screenplay where I think, oh my God, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm going to, I have to stop. Well, this happens particularly uh, in terms of notes because even intelligent notes can be, cannot work for you. But often notes are trying to pull you to destroy what you've created. And what Jeff would say is only write the only use the notes that work for you. Only use the notes which make your screenplay better. Write your screenplay. Don't fake it. Don't try to please anybody else. Only please yourself. Do the best job you possibly can. And then you can sleep at night. If they fire you, they fire you. But you've done your best. And, you know, I've, I've had experiences where uh, I was given a, a note. I've done one note, one thing to do. I've done the opposite. And I turn it in, and the executives at the 
the lower levels go, oh my God, this, isn't go this doesn't work, I'm sorry. And then the guy at the top reads it and says, it's good, it's fine. You know, and we all want to please, and obviously no one wants to get fired off their movie, but as a writer, this is the most long-winded piece of advice. I <laughs> really apologize. But as a writer, only you know what works. I often say that it's, um, it's as if you're sent to a, to a country that no one else has ever been to. And you're reporting back. So if you were the executive and you said, can the character do X, Y, and Z, I can say, no, that doesn't work on this island. But only you know what the rules are. And you have to trust your instincts. You have to trust your gut on it. And if you do that, what you do will ultimately work. And if you don't do that, you will fail. Well, that's great advice. We want to thank today's subject, Nick Kazan, for being with us. Thanks, Nick. You bet. Thank you for watching as well. Please make sure to check out the other outstanding interviews in our series with industry pros. And remember, it all starts with you. The next written by critic could be yours. I'm Mike DeLuca.